Howdy folks, today we're going to continue going over College Board's first SAT, and this is still the reading section. Today's video was highly requested, it's the history passage. So let's get into it. As you all know, the first thing I like to do is to circle and underline anything that stands out from the questions, so any line numbers. This does take a little bit of time, but I promise, at least for me, it ultimately saves time when you're trying to answer the questions and refer back to the passage. I'm also kind of keeping an eye out for summary questions, anything that asks for the main purpose or author's intention. All right, our next step is always to read the little summary here of the passage, because that will give us some key information before we start reading. This passage is by Virginia Woolf. It's written in 1938. and considers the situation of women in English society. So we have our classic women's rights passage right here. Women's rights tends to come up a lot on SAT passages, so this seems pretty standard. Now I'm just going to read through the passage, and if you've already read this or want to skip this part, you can skip to here, but let's get started. Close at hand is a bridge over the River Thames, an admirable vantage ground for us to make a survey. The river flows beneath, barges pass, laden with timber, bursting with corn, there on one side are the domes and spires of the city, on the other, Westminster and the Houses of Parliament. It is a place to stand on by the hour, dreaming, but not now. Now we are pressed for time. Now we are here to consider facts. Now we must fix our eyes upon the procession, the procession of the sons of educated men. There they go, our brothers who have been educated at public schools and universities, mounting those steps, passing in and out of those doors, ascending those pulpits, preaching, teaching, administering justice, practicing medicine, transacting business, making money. It is a solemn sight always, a procession, like a caravanserai crossing a desert. But now, for the past 20 years or so, it is no longer a sight merely, a photograph or a fresco scrawled upon the walls of time at which we can look with merely an aesthetic appreciation. For there, trapezing along at the tail end of the procession, we go ourselves, and that makes a difference. We who have looked so long at the pageant in books, or from a curtained window watched educated men leaving the house at about 9.30 to go to an office, returning to the house at about 6.30 from an office, need look passively no longer. We too can leave the house, can mount those steps, pass in and out of those doors, make money, administer justice. We who now agitate these humble pens may in another century or two speak from a pulpit. Nobody will dare contradict us then. We shall be the mouthpieces of the divine spirit. A solemn thought, is it not? Who can say whether, as time goes on, we may not dress in military uniform, with gold lace at our breasts, swords at our sides, something like the old family coal scuttle on our heads, save that venerable object was never decorated with plumes of white horsehair. You laugh. Indeed, the shadow of the private house still makes those dresses look a little queer. We have worn private clothes so long, but we have not come here to laugh, or to talk of fashions, men's and women's. We are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions. And they are very important questions, and we have very little time in which to answer them. The questions that we have to ask and answer about that procession during this moment of transition are so important that they may well change the lives of all men and women forever. For we have to ask ourselves, here and now, do we wish to join that procession or don't we? On what terms shall we join that procession? Above all, where is it leading us, the procession of educated men? The moment is short. It may last five years, ten years, or perhaps only a matter of a few months longer. But, you will object, you have no time to think. You have your battles to fight, your rent to pay, your bazaars to organize. That excuse shall not serve you, madam. As you know from your own experience, and there are facts that prove it, the daughters of educated men have always done their thinking from hand to mouth, not under green lamps at study tables in the cloisters of secluded colleges. They have thought while they stirred the pot, while they rocked the cradle. It was thus that they won us the right to our brand new sixpence. It falls to us now to go on thinking. How are we to spend that sixpence? Think we must. Let us think in offices, in omnibuses, while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations and Lord Mayor's shows. Let us think in the gallery of the House of Commons, in the law courts. Let us think at baptisms and marriages and funerals. Let us never cease from thinking. What is this civilization in which we find ourselves? What are these ceremonies and why should we take part in them? What are these professions and why should we make money out of them? Where, in short, is it leading us, the procession of the sons of educated men? Whew. So there's a little bit of strange vocab in that, and if we hadn't read this little description, it might have been a lot harder to piece together what they were saying. This passage is Wolf speaking directly to women, trying to get them to think more about what the future is going to hold for women in the workforce. 
and how to proceed forward during kind of this time where women now have some of the same opportunities that men do, but not all of them. So let's get into our questions. All right, so we're starting off strong with a summary question. The main purpose of this passage is to emphasize the value of a tradition, stress the urgency of an issue, highlight the severity of social divisions, or question the feasibility of an undertaking. Now, by tradition, it could be talking about the procession of the sons of educated men, I suppose, but the entire passage didn't really seem to emphasize the value of that. It's more just pondering over what that means for women or what will happen as women join the end of that procession. Since that wasn't the main focus, even though it was used as like a symbol, it's not a, highlighting the severity of social divisions. If this was true, it would be emphasizing that women are very oppressed compared to men at the time, and it'd probably be focusing on women in the household not being able to do some of the same things that men do. But we see that it's kind of actually saying the opposite. Like, now women can leave the house. Yes, there is still definitely ways that women are oppressed in society, but it's getting better, and women kind of have to learn how to navigate this new world where they have more opportunity. So I would say that that is not the main purpose. Then between B and D, these ones both seem like they could be true. Questioning the feasibility of an undertaking. So the undertaking would be like the challenge of getting women in the workforce. Feasibility means like the ease of something, so how easily something can be done. In the passage, Wolf isn't exactly saying that it's going to be difficult, more like it just requires thought as to how to proceed. If we look at B, we can tell that this is definitely true. We can find textual evidence for this because she says things like, there are very important questions and very little time in which to answer them. The moment is short. And there's, and she says, the questions that we have to ask and answer are so important that they might as well change the lives of all men and women forever. That's a very important issue. And there's not a lot of time to answer it. So there's definitely a lot of urgency behind this issue. Between B and D, B is definitely looking like the right answer. For our next question, this looks like another summary type question. So the central claim of the passage is that educated women face a decision about how to engage with existing institutions. Women can have positions of influence in English society only if they give up some of their traditional roles. The male monopoly on power in English society has had grave and continuing effects. Or the entry of educated women into positions of power traditionally held by men will transform those positions. So let's eliminate the wrong answers. First, she doesn't really directly talk about the male monopoly on power. It's definitely important to consider that given the context, but she's not exactly saying that society is terrible because men are in power. That might be a little too strong of a stance to give to her. Plus, these, this word like grave, that has some strong connotation. She does mention the word solemn, but I think that's more in reference to the workforce just being generally miserable, not exactly because of male power. For B, this one's kind of a trade-off, like women can take positions of influence only if they give up some of their traditional roles. I do remember it talking about those who agitate those humble pens may in a century or two speak from a pulpit, so like gaining more power over time, but they don't really have to lose their traditional housewife role in order to do that, or else that might be just something you infer but not directly stated. She never mentions that there's a direct trade-off between, like, you can either be a housewife or be in the workforce. So since it's not a complete dichotomy, B is incorrect. Now, between the last two, if we look at D, if women join the workforce, it will transform those positions. I think the mention of those positions is kind of what gives this one away. Because she does mention that this is a crazy moment of transition, and it may change the lives of all men and women forever. That's kind of what the change would be. But as for transforming the workforce, there's not really much evidence for that. So with A, educated women face a decision about how to engage with existing institutions. I think this is definitely the most strongly backed up claim of the passage. Because throughout the entire passage, she's saying, let us never cease from thinking. She asks all these rhetorical questions about kind of the future of women in society and where is this procession leading us? I think this procession could kind of be a metaphor for the existing institutions because it's full of the sons of educated men. And now that women are joining this procession, 
women are joining the workforce, kind of getting a better role in society, women have to decide how they're going to move forward. So A is our answer for this one. Next one. Wolf uses the word we throughout the passage mainly to reflect the growing friendliness among a group of people, advance the need for candor among groups of people, establish a sense of solidarity among a group of people, or reinforce the need for respect among a group of people. So all of these have the same base here. So she's trying to do something among a group of people, but let's look at our changing verbs and nouns for each one of these. I also find that with author intent questions, this one's kind of like, why is Wolf using the word we? It helps to really keep in mind the main focus of the passage, because we don't know what's going on in Wolf's head when she's writing this. These questions are always going to be based on what's going on in the passage, so you will be able to back it up with textual evidence. You don't just have to make a guess about what she's saying. So out of all four of these, the one that makes the most sense given the passage is establishing a sense of solidarity among a group of people, which would be women. So we said before she was kind of addressing women as a whole. She's kind of doing that by using the we, because she's also a woman. She's trying to bring all women together to think about these issues that she's worried about. The other three, we can cross these out. The growing friendliness, I guess you might be tempted to choose if you thought that men were being more friendly to women in the workforce, and that's what was like letting them come into the workforce. I don't know, that's kind of a stretch. It doesn't really make sense why she would be using we in that case. Reinforce the need for respect among a group of people. This one might be tempting to choose because she does probably want more respect for women in society, but why would she use the word we to do that? We kind of brings people together, like we the people of the United States. We refers to everyone within a group of people and brings them closer together. So we doesn't really accomplish gaining respect for a group of people. And then advancing the need for candor among a group of people. Candor is like truthfulness, yay divergent. So advancing the need for truthfulness among, among who? It's good to ask, who is she advancing the need of candor for? Like, among women as a group, or among the group of women and men in the workforce? Like, I don't know what that would be referring to. We can clearly name the group of people that she's trying to establish solidarity within, and it makes sense given the context of these we's. Like, we are pressed for time, women are pressed for time dealing with these issues. Okay, according to the passage, Wolf chooses the setting of the bridge because it is conducive to a mood of fanciful reflection. It provides a good view of the procession of the sons of educated men. It is within the site of historic episodes to which she alludes, or it is a symbol of the legacy of the past and present sons of educated men. Don't get too bogged down by the language here. It says, according to the passage. So we better be able to find an exact phrase that points to one of these answers. This one's sadly not a daily double, so we can't use our little trick, but we can still search for that evidence to back up whichever answer choice we choose. I think we should focus on the first paragraph because that's where she mentions the bridge mostly. So here she says, Close at hand is the bridge, an admirable vantage ground for us to make a survey. We are here to consider facts. We must fix our eyes upon the procession, the procession of the sons of educated men. That to me sounds like the bridge is just a good place to watch this procession go by. It provides a good vantage point. And we can cross off all the other answers by looking at the parts of the text that might confirm them, kind of debunking it. So the bridge being good for fanciful reflection, we see she does mention it is a good place to stand on by the hour dreaming, but not now. So that's not what they're doing on the bridge right now. They're not just daydreaming, they're trying to consider the facts, they're pressed for time, they're trying to find solutions to this issue. So that one is out. Now there might be symbolism here, but you would really have to infer any symbolism. She doesn't directly say, this bridge is a legacy of the past and present sons of educated men. It represents the future and the past. She doesn't do anything like that, really. So that one's out. Is it within sight of historic episodes to which she alludes? I guess maybe. I mean, there are places, like the Houses of Parliament on one side, and there's like the city on the other side of the river. But that's not the main reason why she chose the bridge. I think she's just saying that to add a character, to add a little bit of visual description. The main point is that they're, they're watching this procession, not that they're considering the historical precedence of the bridge or the stuff near the bridge. So B definitely makes the most sense if we refer to that first paragraph. Okay, finally we have our daily double. Yay. So this is why I like to highlight these lines ahead of time. So if you don't know, these are our two-part questions, and I like to answer them in kind of a weird way, but it makes it much easier in my opinion. The first thing we're going to do is read question 36. 
without the answer choices. Wolf indicates that the procession she describes in the passage, and in some cases, the question will be phrased really vaguely like that, where the bulk of it is actually in the answer choices. In that case, I think it's just best to read the answer choices along with it so you have some idea of what you're looking for, but then still read these quotes before you answer this question. So let's read those, because we don't know what she's referring to about the procession unless we read these answer choices. The procession she describes in the passage has come to have more practical influence in recent years, has become a celebrated feature of English public life, includes all the riches and most powerful men in England, or has become less exclusionary in its membership in recent years. So we're about to read these quotes, and when we do, we're looking for something that verifies any of these four. There they go, our brothers who have been educated at public schools and universities, mounting those steps, passing in and out of those doors, ascending those pulpits, preaching, teaching, administering justice, practicing medicine, transacting business, making money. I don't think that really answers any of the four. Maybe that would answer A or B, but that's kind of a stretch, so I don't think A really does anything. It is a solemn sight always, a procession like a caravanserai crossing a desert. That doesn't really answer anything either, that's just saying it's like kind of serious. So you see how easy it is to cross these out once we kind of know exactly what we're looking for in this question? Between the last two, let's see. For there, trapezing along at the tail end of the procession, we go ourselves, referring to women, versus we too can leave the house, can mount those steps, pass in and out of those doors, make money, administer justice. We who now agitate these humble pens may in another century or two speak from a pulpit. These two are both talking about more opportunities for women. From our remaining two, we can definitely select an answer for choice one which would be that the procession has become less exclusionary in its membership in recent years. Women are getting more opportunities to join it. We know that D is our answer here because, because none of these three are even remotely backed up by any of our lines here. Now, I think this question is actually really tricky between these two, but now we know we're looking for evidence that the procession she describes in the passage has become less exclusionary in its membership. Remember, both of these talk about like women's opportunities, but C is the one that most closely talks about the procession and women being on the tail end of that procession. D also kind of theorizes about the future a little bit too much because we're talking directly about the procession. So even though these two are pretty close in their language, I would choose C here. Wow, our second daily double right after the other one. Alrighty, well now we're well prepared for this. And it's looking like it's gonna be the same situation where we can't quite do the daily double method perfectly because the main meat of the question is the answer choices but let's do our revised method. So, Wolf characterizes the questions in line 53 through 57 as both controversial and threatening, weighty and unanswerable, momentous and pressing, or provocative and mysterious. So first let's read lines 53 through 57. It's bracketed right here. For we have to ask ourselves here and now, do we wish to join that procession or don't we? On what terms shall we join that procession? Above all, where is it leading us, the procession of educated men? She repeats that a lot. Um, so those are the questions that she's referring to. Now let's look at our answer choices. So we have these adjectives kind of in our brains, but we're not gonna try to pick one out just yet. So these starred ones are the corresponding quotes. We have worn private clothes so long, but we haven't come here to laugh or to talk of fashions, men's and women's. We are here on the bridge to ask ourselves certain questions. Now does that really answer what the nature of the questions is? That more is just saying, why the women are there. So I would say A is out. Here we go. And they are very important questions, and we have very little time in which to answer them. That better describes the nature of the questions themselves as important and, and urgent, which kind of goes along with our first summary question too, stressing the urgency of these questions. Um, let's read our other two just to make sure. We have the moment is short, which doesn't give a ton of context about the questions themselves, or that excuse shall not serve you, madam, which also doesn't answer the nature of the questions. So this one's pretty clear that B is our correct answer for the second part. And now we can use that quote to answer which adjectives best describe it. So we have controversial and threatening, weighty and unanswerable, momentous and pressing, or provocative and mysterious. Now, I would stray away from the very colorful sounding language. Mysterious and provocative kind of have a lot of power behind them. They don't seem like completely neutral words, so that's probably not our correct answer. If we remember, we actually came up with the adjectives important and urgent when we were looking at this. I would say that the closest thing to that is momentous and pressing, 
pressing for the urgency and momentous because they're very grand and important. So this one's looking like C is the correct answer. And the other two, we might get confused because women in the workforce was probably controversial and threatening to men, but that's not what the question is asking. So that's not our correct answer. And weighty and unanswerable. Weighty is kind of a good adjective in this case, but unanswerable, she doesn't ever say that they can't be answered. And she, she encourages women to think a lot about them. So that would suggest that there probably is a right answer. Home stretch here. Which choice most closely captures the meaning of the figurative sixpence referred to in lines 70 and 71? So let's go back to that. Oh, I actually didn't underline that, but whatever. It was thus that they, meaning like past women, won us the right to our brand new sixpence. It falls to us now to go on thinking, how are we to spend that sixpence? So here she's not referring to a literal coin. She's more referring to the chance that women finally got to be a part of the workforce, to get educated, that type of stuff. So the sixpence definitely refers to their opportunity to do these things. That's the only one that really makes sense here. That metaphor definitely checks out because if you have a coin, you have some purchasing power with that coin. You have the opportunity to spend it in whatever way you want. So women now have that coin in their hands. They have the opportunity and they have to figure out how they want to spend that coin to use their opportunity. The range of places and occasions listed in lines 72 through 76 mainly serves to emphasize how novel the challenge faced by women is, pervasive the need for critical reflection is, complex the political and social issues of the day are, or emphasize how enjoyable the career possibilities for women are. Let's turn back to this. Here's my terrible bracket around this one. Let us think in offices, in omnibuses, while we are standing in the crowd watching coronations, blah, blah. Let us think in the House of Commons, law courts, baptisms, marriages, funerals. That's a lot of places listed there. And Wolf is urging the women to think in all of them. I think the phrase let us think helps us the most here because um, she's not talking about potential career possibilities for women in these fields. She's saying that, yes, you may call yourself busy, but you still have time to think throughout your day, even when you're doing other things. So D is out. C is also out because, yes, there are complex political and social issues, but her mentioning those places doesn't really have any correlation with that. Like if we read the lines before, these historical women have thought while they stirred the pot and while they rocked the cradle. So even though they didn't get the same education and they didn't have a formal space to do their thinking, they still managed to do it and that's what gained women the opportunities they have today. So hopefully the answer is kind of sticking out at you by now. The range of places and occasions listed, it serves to emphasize how pervasive the need for critical reflection is. Critical reflection is just another word for thinking, which matches with what that whole section is about. And the pervasiveness of it is how it's important to do it in every aspect of your life. At funerals, at weddings, while you're watching coronations, all that stuff, you can still be thinking about your role in society as you go about your daily activities. So B is our correct answer. A actually doesn't work at all either because this isn't a new challenge for women. These pioneering women also faced the same issue where they had to do their thinking in, in creative spaces. So it's not really a new challenge faced by women. They've been finding creative ways to educate themselves for thousands of years or whatever. So A is out. So that is the end of this section. Sorry for the beams of sunlight coming in here. Hope you all enjoyed this. Hope it made sense. I know the history passage is everyone's least favorite, but hopefully this made it a little bit easier. And next time we'll be focusing on the classic debate passages. And this one's actually another science passage too. Tune in next time for that. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. Comment down below with any tips for people or if you have any additional questions. And bye!